Hello everybody, this is Nahaz, and men lie, women lie, but stats don't lie. Welcome to our next Kiev Major Recap here. I had planned initially to make a couple of videos for you guys, sort of bird's eye views of the tournament, uh, my top five Kiev Major storylines, as well as a Road to TI video, looking at where I think the invite picture stands now, as well as how the number of huge upcoming lands between now and the time that in invites go out have the potential to affect that picture. I still plan on doing those, but as I look back from the game footage, uh, at the game footage from Kiev, I just, I had to make this video for you guys to talk about the quarterfinal round. This is, I think, one of the best days of Dota that we've ever seen at any event. You had four huge series. All four of them ended two to one. There were great comeback plays, great individual plays on, the, on behalf of all eight teams in all of these series. So I just really wanted to take at least a short video. <laughs> I say that right and break these four series down for you. We're going to start off with IG and Liquid. This was our first series of the day. Uh, game one of this series was incredibly close, came down to core versus core. OP and burning on their Ember Spirit and Morphling for IG had one death combined. Miracle had eight deaths on his TA, as well as a little bit of a questionable late game pickoff that led to IG's victory in that game. Not to take anything away from Miracle, we know he can what he can do. Uh, he was one of the most outstanding individual players of this tournament, but IG definitely had the edge there. Coming into game two, it started with a little bit of an interesting play here as Ice Frog loves to troll us with his uh, Hadoukens from the big Seder. Here the Seder gets a double kill on mind control and Bobakaz MK with Burning's Animage is just kind of standing here going WTF. Well, not so long into this game, Burning wasn't going WTF here. As he in a pivotal mid-game engagement here for IG, they're at a little bit of a deficit, but Burning unloads with the three hero over 1.5k total damage here done with this mana void the am looked to be firmly control in the of the match at this point ig were playing a tempo game which they're very very comfortable doing looked like they had liquid in good position to uh, close the series out but it was really to me it was uh the gh earthshaker and the Matumum Inspector that really kept Liquid in and eventually sealed this game. Just to give you an example, this was a fight where I thought IG really had all the momentum down here in the Radiant Jungle off of a Liquid push. You can see Matumum on his Spectre is able to juke out the duel by using Haunt. I believe he used Reality multiple times, which you can do now. And this is great presence of mind here by GH on his Earthshaker. Knows that because the Spectre has free pathing up from Spectral Dagger, he doesn't have to worry about blocking his Spectre off. Goes ahead and goes for the Fisher onto the two IG heroes. Matumum with that free pathing is able, and Ion Shell, of course, on top is able to come through and get those two heroes uh, at least stabilize the game. But it was really this 45 minute fight that broke it open for Liquid. IG, again, devoting a ton of resources to those two heroes. They're able to get the pick off on GH's Earthshaker in the Dire Jungle, and they bring three and eventually four heroes. Initiate on Matumbum Inspector here mid. Uh, you can see he's dueled up. They're going to drop multiple ultis on this. The only thing at this point in the fight, the only thing that's gone wrong for IG is that the OP Storm Spirit is really low on health and mana, but they got the initial pick off on the huge earth shaker uh they they've got three heroes and it's eventually going to be four in position to kill the metumum inspector they just aren't able to do it bobokaz monkey king gets low as well he's forced to run away a little bit from the fight even with those stacks on his passive active here and metumum 1v4 at this point brings down the warlock with that Radiance and Dispersion just doing tons of damage. Again, the Storm Spirit can't really connect to the fight. And a couple of huge critical things happen in this fight. Number one, they know that Warlock is down and he's not going to have his rock up for any push. Number two, they're fairly certain at this point that LC, she's going to have her dual back up, but she's not going to have buyback. So they make a great read to go ahead and push, keep the pressure on IG after this pivotal fight. And it pays off big time. They push the radiant base. They look like they're going to get forced back. They're taking a bunch of damage 
damage as again op's storm spirit really active early on in the fight but gh makes an amazing read here jumps into the radiant base they have a ward up here for vision he jumps in gets the echo slam onto the two supports of ig liquid as a team are able to follow it up uh op unfortunately miss it looked like he missed time one of his jumps a little bit with his storm spirit he gets caught in the follow-up to the echo slam gh able to lock down three heroes burnings animage you can see unsuccessfully bk beat up trying to force him down with the rest of liquid's team in position to come in here and clean up again huge huge play uh from liquid on that one and four position really keys the game this ends up being a two for four exchange liquid gets multiple sets of racks and is able to get themselves back into the series but game three an absolute clinic from ig in team fight positioning you can see here in the figure they're down big early on in this game liquid had seven out of the first eight team kills but xxs's darkster able to turn things around here with just a massive combo here mid he's able to get the three hero vac wall off on three liquid heroes on i believe the cm the od and the legion commander they are able to get this three-man vacuum into wall with the supernova on top they win that engagement and set themselves up for just a beautifully executed fight on the bottom. Again, you know, you talk about great reads. Liquid had a great read on the ultimate team fight in game two. IG had a couple of amazing reads and fights in this game. They, they know here they're set up for a push on the bottom tower. They know it's probable that GH is going to be in the trees to the right of his tower on his Earthshaker. And it's probable that the remaining liquid heroes are going to be split to the upper left here, either all in one spot or more likely the Dark Seer plus maybe one hero in position for the follow-up initiation to the left of the tower. That's exactly where they were. They jump in, they spot GH's Earthshaker in the trees. They jump in with just a beautiful Wukong's command. Look at how this splits up the fight. Right. Burning is able to run in. He's in front anyway. He's able to run in and OP remnants in behind him with the Ember Spirit. They isolate and they're able to bring down Miracles, Outworld, Devour. The rest of Liquid are trying to focus down the Q Phoenix. But I mean, this is just an absolutely spectacular play. He gets dueled, but an instant, an instant before the duel goes off he gets icarus dive off so he dives all the way behind the tower, the tower actually gets an assist on the kill of matumba of uh, sorry miracles outworld devour he wastes almost half the duel duration in that icarus dive you can see he's muted for the he's muted and taunted for the entire time and the, as a result they're not able to bring him down and he gets the supernova off to secure an absolutely huge huge fight for ig and this is again just another perfectly executed perfectly spaced team fight here to end the game for ig i mean liquid they can't feel too bad about this series because the level at which ig had to play i think to beat them was so incredible you can see gh once again huge huge series on this earth shaker he's looking to initiate on these three very vulnerable ig heroes here the two supports uh as well as the uh, four ig heroes as well as the dark seer down here with his echo slam he gets his blink dagger canceled so he has to run back a little bit but he's still got these four ig heroes that are all clumped up burning of course is leading the charge as he was before he's looking to come back in with the echo slam but i mean this is just the perfect delta split they know exactly what's going on the wraith king actually got imprisoned op and q are just on the periphery of the echo slam here they miss it xxs has run straight down as the dark seer i mean this is all happening in real time it's split second reactions to know hey we're grouped up we avoided getting caught with the echo slam initially in the fight but we need to go in three different directions and they're all exactly on the border as gh comes in they're not going to repeat the same mistake that they made in game two and then of course once that big echo is out of the way they're able to group back up xxs comes in hits a huge back wall combo on his dark seer they take out two of the remaining three liquid heroes and they're able to burst down the od with no problem 
absolutely flawless execution here from IG throughout this game. I still say from a, from a purely executional standpoint, I think IG might have played some of the best Dota that we saw in the tournament in this series. Uh, very, very well-earned victory for them. Liquid, nothing to feel ashamed about. I think they're going to be absolutely fine. They maybe do, uh, as I discussed before, need to look to get Mind Control, his farm, a little bit more consistently going into the mid-game. But I think they're a team that's going to continue to be a threat. Next series of the day, this is probably on paper was supposed to have been the most lopsided matchup of this round, but Faceless are able to make it a series against OG. They actually take the ult the opening game. And if you remember when we were talking about the matchup between TNC and Faceless, I worried a lot for TNC because Ice Ice Ice, when he plays team fight oriented lineups, he just tends to be so disruptive. He tends to pick these sort of bothersome off laners and just get in your face and disrupt what you're trying to do in these fights. And this is a perfect example of it on the Abaddon. They initiated onto the Abaddon with three heroes. I mean, he's running up here for a good 15 seconds. They trigger borrowed time and they've got a bat rider and alchemist and they've got S4 S4 here. They've got their one, their, uh, their three, three and four position heroes up here chasing around the enemy team's offlaner who has the early radiance. Just look, by the time Nuts' CM comes in here to secure the, the kill on No Tails Alchemist, look how low the other two heroes are. Ice Ice Ice, just by, just by kiting them around, uh, manages to get the kill on the Alchemist with one hero assisting and manages to take about half or more of the HP off the remaining two heroes. And they're just able to come in and, and clean up and clean house. Faceless takes the first game. OG down one for the third time in the event. Uh, you know, a lot of us are kind of wondering, is OG sort of going off stage looking at each other? Are they going to start to play the blame game? No, this team is a three-time major champion for a reason. Had a pretty good draft here in game two. A very underrated aspect, in my opinion, of the way that they run the Naga Siren. We've talked about the fact that No Tail doesn't necessarily put up the huge farming numbers on his Naga like some of the other big Naga players, but it doesn't really matter. Seven out of the last 10 OG Naga games where they've run No Tail on the hero have actually ended before the 43 minute mark. They're undefeated in those games. They are perfectly comfortable having their Naga come in, contribute to team fights early, play around the Song of the Siren. That's exactly what they were able to do in this game. And Jerax with the pud. I, I thought Jerax's pudge in this game was really huge. He hit two absolutely key hooks on the uh, on the two big cores for Faceless, hooking in first the Jabs OD and next the Black's Morph Link to secure that fight. Uh, Ana, you can see on his TA, is already beyond godlike at this point in the match. The route is on, and OG are going to take it to a game three in this series. And in game three, guys, I, I think. Faceless were just flat out outdrafted in this game. Um, this is not always the case. In fact, in my opinion, it's rarely the case, but armor was the single most important be all do all statistic in this draft. If you look, so uh, second pick here, last overall pick be, uh, belongs to Faceless. So they're forced to make their second phase selections first. They're going to pick a bristleback into a Naga disruptor annex. Maybe not the best, maybe not the worst pick on paper. OG come immediately back with the Terror Blade. They've not now got their one and two position heroes are two heroes that have 15 and 21 armor respectively at level 25 with no items. That means these two heroes, their HP is effectively doubled against the physical damage of Bristleback. And that's all he does. So all of a sudden you think back to game one and how disruptive Ice 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 was able to be, how he's able to kite multiple OG heroes around, get them all low, force them to burn a bunch of their cooldowns. Bristle isn't going to be that kind of problem in this match. And the real genius of it immediately when you start looking at a draft where one side's got a lot of physical damage, where the other side is running a very high armor lineup, immediately the hero you have to be super aware of is going to be the Elder Titan. OG actually used 
all but four seconds of their reserve time. And they fifth ban Pugna. They're very worried about the early push lineup, the very early push potential coming out from the other side. And they block pick. They actually take the Elder Titan for themselves before Faceless can contest it. This is just an absolutely huge strat. It means that Ice Ice Ice's Bristle is going to have a hard time doing anything anything faceless do go back to tiny for the burst damage their best bet at this point is to try and bring down this terror blade and naga with the magical burst combo but it just isn't going to be enough in this game this is again just contrast this fight with what we talked about in game one for Faceless, uh, OG are able to play perfectly around the song. You can't tell from this photo, but they actually do have the Alchemist caught down here in the song as well. They have Ice 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 isolated around all five heroes. And unlike game one, this Bristleback, because of the huge armor coming out, he just can't do anything. You, the, the two supports, they're off screen here. But the two OG supports are actually standing up here within range of the quills. They don't have to worry about any of this. They can get in and out as they want to. And all three of the cores for OG, Axe with his call, Ana and No-Tail with their, with their inherently high armor, they can stand in the bristleback quills and burst him down no problem whatsoever. So to me... OG played very well in this series, but I think if Faceless had this to do over again, they're going to rework that Game 3 draft, and they might be able to take it. This was a really, again, we've looked at Faceless for some time. They felt like they were lacking that big win. Maybe this is their breakthrough tournament. They, they beat TNC to get to top eight. They put up a hell of a fight against OG. Hopefully, this is a team that will stay together through the upcoming shuffle. Now, again, Virtus Pro and VGJ, big rematch on paper, but once again, it was the underdog team that came out absolutely red hot after their upset of DC. VGJ took game one, aggressive, went 9-0 and 13 on Lifestealer. Uh, FY was in on 26 out of 30 kills as Monkey King, exactly how you draw it up in their playbook. Virtus Pro, dubbed by many to be the tournament favorites now that Secret was out, is left kind of looking at each other. Absolutely no problem. Uh, going into game two, VP have a masterful team fight at 15 minutes at the Roche Pit. Uh, Fenrir had a four hero overgrowth initiation, but this is really where we're going to talk about later on about 40 R's Lena play for SG. This is really where Free some of Freeze's youth and inexperience caught up to him. They got the good initiation, did VGJ. Fenris was standing up here on his treant, came down invis, got the four hero overgrowth. Uh, Freeze is actually out of the picture in your left hand side. He came in, he was only off that four hero overgrowth. He was only able to get one follow up dragon slave. He can't get his light strike off. He actually couldn't get his Laguna blade off until much later in the fight. And as a result, he can't stun the crystal maiden out of ulti. So solo can sit here and protect the remaining VP heroes from the Omni Knight and the Lena burst potential. They're able to get all their spells off from the steps there. And eventually in the fight, Freeze is going to get chased down. The rest of his team is dead at this point. He's come into the fight, but it's just too late. He's got all the VP heroes standing around him. He tries to use the Laguna Blade to get rid of the Pasha Magnus, who had a wonderful counter initiation with the two-man RP in and, of, in and of himself. But you can see he's just got no chance here. These spells are coming out way too late. He's actually hitting his stuns, hitting his Laguna Blade. But by this point in the fight, he's already lost three heroes from his side. It doesn't really matter. It's worth noting, by the way, after this game too, an incredible individual performance by no one on TA. He actually now has three, uh, two of the top three GPM marks posted in a professional Dota 2 game ever on the hero. 960 and 921 GPM. That came out of this game. He had an incredible tournament from an individual perspective. If you're giving out tournament MVP awards, you have to be looking at Ramsey's and no one just by virtue of their statistical performances alone. Uh, absolutely great from start to finish in this tournament. Game three was just flat out nuts, guys. You can see this game was neck and neck right until the 30 minute mark. And even after losing a big team fight at the four, 
after winning a big team fight at the 45 minute mark, uh, the game still wasn't over. VGJ actually had another good fight for them. And we needed a pretty good team, another pretty good team fight by VP to close out the game. So let's take a look at those two. Uh, here's the first one. They actually, VGJ was actually running a Pugna lineup in this one. They were had an early advantage and they were on the steps of the Radiant base from fairly early on. Fortunately, great static storm here by Solo. Little bit of a mistake by Fenrir after the gigantic initiation earlier. He actually blinks down and, and is caught just barely on the right edge of this static storm. So he has all his spells, including overgrowth up. He cannot get them off and he can't help his multiple team his multiple teammates uh, that are trapped here in the static storm with all of these radiant side heroes. Lil did a great job darting in and out of the fight getting out uh, getting off his crushes all on multiple heroes and then Ramses eventually is able to clean up he survives this fight on 15 HP the static storm that we just showed got the they had the Aegis did VGJ going into this fight the static storm got the Aegis down and then Ramses living on a prayer here is able to clean it up and this is really where Virtus Pro sees the momentum this is you know in the past we've sort of questioned Virtus Pro's ability to to do two things okay first of all to play in a game where they may be behind VP is a team going through the years, going back years and years in Pro Dota 2. They have the most games played of any professional Dota 2 franchise, all right? Over 1500. They're a team that's always like to play from that's always like to play from ahead. They don't do well when the opponent is the one forcing the action. And the other thing is they sometimes have trouble making adjustments in the game. They showed that they could do both in this series. Uh VGJ has all the momentum at this point in the game. They execute a wonderful fight. Their two supports using their spells really, really well. Their cores living on almost no HP to get him back in it. And then the clincher. It, it felt like this was the day of the Darkseer because, my God, the number of three to five hero vac wall combos that we saw on this day and in the tournament as a whole, absolutely unbelievable. And Pasha, who had kind of an up and down tournament overall, in this absolutely delivers vac wall combo again great static storm from solo good positioning here in the trees to keep himself alive they get that combo off on all five vgj heroes uh this this for all intents and purposes decided the game and it's just a great great team fight execution uh once again here by vgj I don't, I'm sorry, by Virtus Pro. I don't think VGJ really have anything to worry about with one exception, okay? Um, they're a very, very good team. And FY and Fen here, Fenrir, in all likelihood, they're going to get two more wins and they're going to pass Dendi and Havosht uh, with 576 career wins. That's going to be top five all time as a duo. Great record for them. A, a pair of guys that have been playing support together for a very long time. Freeze is still an issue with this team. A uh, lot of talent, a lot of people in the Chinese scene that I spoke to six months ago really thought highly of this kid and his potential. Still a very young player, but he's very inconsistent in this tournament, both in his laning mechanics and in his position in mid-game engagements. That's something, you know, VGJ, when they first burst onto the scene as a team, you go, you go all the way back to last year when they came out and they uh, they – dominated in the Starladder Invitational held in Kiev, they did it behind a mid player who was playing as a stand-in behind their coach, Mikasa, and they did it by playing around that mid so well. He was almost always behind in the laning phase, but they played around him in mid-game engagements very well, and his individual positioning was so excellent that they were able to beat teams with top-tier mids. This is what they're not doing around Freeze, okay? Freeze's individual positioning isn't that great, and VGJ are not helping him as a team. They're not 
helping him by getting him into the right positioning, uh, initiating fights when he's going to have the right timing behind him. So this is an issue that they badly need to address. You cannot win in Dota right now when they're going to, if you're going to draft these kinds of lineups, you can't win without heavy team fight participation from your mid. You can go with a farming mid. You can run your alchemists. You can run your Naga mid, whatever you want. But that's not the lineups that they're picking. They're picking mostly Lena and heroes like that for freeze. If you're going to do that, you have to have high team fight uh, participation. And that means you need to have your mid have excellent positioning. Just not executing that the way they need to right now. All right. Final series of the day. I mean, I, I don't even know what I can say about this one. Uh, this was an absolute tour de force in terms of back and forth to the bitter end. Uh, you go into the series, you say, okay, SG, the Cinderella team, they're gonna just going to be happy to be here. They pulled the massive upset over Secret in that dramatic three-game series. But once again, they come out in game one and they put on a hell of a show. Tavo is ridiculous again for the second straight game. He, land, he hits 21 EG heroes with his last seven uses of epicenter. He's averaging a three-man epicenter against one of the top teams in the world, one of the best team fight positioning teams we've ever seen in Dota in EG, and he's able to consistently pull off his spells like this. Just can't say enough about his individual performances in the tournament. I'll talk about this when we get to the overall story lines video but for my money Tavo was your MVP of the Kiev major I just can't believe what he was able to do against these world-class opponents but eventually in game one it came down to this Quap versus Lena matchup late and unfortunately this is where Lena really struggled in the tournament she was 9 and 10 overall in matches that ended before the 50 minute mark not great, but not bad. Re perfectly respectable record. She went one and eight in this tournament in matches that went past 50 minutes. And that really was what happened. 40 r couldn't have the kind of impact that he wanted to on that Lena late against the Sumail Queen of Pain. Game two, I mean, again, what more can you say about Tavo going to Carnival here with a four-man black hole on the Evil Geniuses? And I want to stress, they took the Enigma early in the draft. They got counterpicked. They got flat out hardcore counterpicked by the Rubik crit an amazing Rubik player for evil geniuses. And, he, and they're still able to pull off combos like this. And if you look at it, it was the Night Stalker for the Silence as well as the Vision, and it was 40R on his puck. This is, to me, it's a three-man black hole in the Radiant base, but you can just see on the bottom right here, 40R on his puck. He knows his number one job is to blink in and to lock down the Rubik. The Night Stalker is not in the position to silence the Rubik, so it has to be the puck here coming in from the side, silencing Crit's Rubik before he can steal black hole. You can see Tavo has his BKB up, but that doesn't matter. Spell through, spell steal goes right through that BKB, and then of course black hole doesn't care. Crit's in great position here to punish. He sees most of the SG esports squad up here, but he's not counting necessarily on 40 yards puck coming in landing the silence so that Tavo is able to get off the full dimension uh, the, the full duration black hole uh Zai's Ricky isn't necessarily caught in it but he's already dropped his smoke and Tavo's got BKB up anyway there's just nothing that he can do uh they're able to close out again Another just gargantuan black hole that's able to close out the game for SG. Uh, Crit actually GG'd out of the game immediately after this fight. A four-man black hole, including catching the Rubik on the tail end of the high ground here to prevent the counter. Tavo blinks in, drops the four-man black hole on, on EG. SG win the fight, and EG says, you know what? Let's go game three, guys. And again, you know, when you when you compare this to the previous two series, the previous two series, the underdog team came out and won game one. OK, much more likely that you're going to see all three games in a series where that happens than when the underdog. I thought the air was out of the balloon 
for SGE Esports after game one. They put up a heck of a fight. They got out dueled late. You tip your cap. That's a talented team on the other side. One of the top teams in the world. You say, all right, fine. I kind of thought the air was out of the balloon in game two. No way. SG, they go on. They draft a very high risk, very uh, execution intensive. Well, you talk about ease of execution. This is not an easy to execute lineup against what EG had in this game. And SG are still able to pull out the game two force the series to a decisive game three and and this was just you know once again we've heard the story over and over again it ended up being the Sumail show uh SG puts up a great fight early they had two fights EG looked like they were going to take this game in fairly straightforward fashion they're up almost 10k net worth at the 32 minute mark when uh sg had just wonderful back-to-back -back fights you want to talk about positioning by alina here's showing you how it's done they position themselves very very well around the clockwork cogs uh crit was actually in perfect position on his tree he opened this fight by blocking a clockwork hook shot out of invis he knew exactly what was coming you can see how concerned sgr about that tree's position and yeah three sentry wards up here all right they know i'm sorry these are eg sentries all right they knew what was coming crit blocks out the hook shot by the clockwork it looks like it's going to be a good fight for eg but they get trapped in by these cogs all right, 40 yards, able to just stand on the high ground, dish out those spells, dish out the right clicks. They're all going to get fatal bonded up about a second after this. You see 40 yard actually eats the blade mill, bursting down the universe LC with Laguna Blade and doesn't care. He's able to stay in this fight to the very end, get his spells off on the four fatal bonds EG heroes. And eventually the damage output from SG is just too much. But the fight that really, all right, one more from SG here. Sorry about that. Jumping the gun a little bit. Uh, same script, really. It's fighting around the cogs with the Lena in the back. She's got her BKB up to partially mitigate the danger of a blade mill. There was a really huge uh, flame break here by Tavo's Batrider to knock the Spectre back all the way outside to the right of the cogs. He's got his blade mill active but you can see he can't necessarily get back up into the radiant base he's dealing with that aoe upheaval channeled by the warlock they've got everybody in good position they've survived the deal by the legion commander they're about to kill her off right right as shallow grave ends here and they've got a clear path to killing rtz it really looked at this point sg had a massive advantage they're inside the radiant base it looked like their series to lose when in the immortal words of former LGD captain Zhao and newbie captain Zhao 8, you don't Roche when you're ahead. Well, unfortunately, that's exactly what SG tried to do. Possibly trying to set thems up, themselves up for the decisive GG push. They've got five heroes here in the Roche pit. They get initiated on absolutely perfect smoke initiation here by eg they hit a they hit a marvelous scan some would say lucky but they had a really really good scan just about 30 seconds before this so they knew where sg were they were up here on the dire steps uh on the dire steps setting up for roche they waited they gave sg about 30 to 40 seconds to group themselves up after that scan and come here into the roche pit smoked up went down and this is what ensued um this guy's okay this is why i think maybe overwhelming odds needs a little bit of a nerf after this tournament overwhelming odds at level four does 100 base damage plus 120 damage per each enemy hero this is a 700 damage overwhelming odds on to all five sg it was it was only four yard being quick fingered on the bkb save this from being just an instant team melting but you've got the 700 damage overwhelming odds you got all three of pucks nukes going down the dream coil the orb and the waning rift on all of their heroes you can see and just the chunks that are coming off the sg esports life bars this is a huge huge win for EG, and they're eventually able to secure the game off the back of that. Um, to me, I thought if you if you stack all four of these series in one day, 
This was probably the most remarkable individual day of Dota I have seen at a major. I think all eight of these teams have to look at the level at which they played and be pretty pleased going into the TI. And if if you think if you think that a couple weeks ago I thought I'd be saying that about SG Esports, you're absolutely crazy. But I'm going to tell you this right now. The SG Esports team with Tavo playing like he did, especially, okay, and 40R on his puck and HFN on his juggernaut. This SG Esports team, if this team shows up at TI, they're going to beat a few people. All right. They're going to be a factor. Look at TNC last year playing in some ways very, very similar style to what SG showed in this series. I think this team has a ton of potential going forward. Like I said, if I had a vote, I, despite the fact that they lost this series, I'm probably giving Tavo my MVP of the tournament just for the ridiculous uh, AOE ultimates that he's able to land in the two series against Secret and EG. I know lots of other players would be in contention for that award, but to me, those individual performances in those two series, I, I mean, yeah, sometimes I don't go with the stats. Anyway, I've got a couple of videos coming up for you guys on Kiev. Thanks for listening here. This was a lot of fun. I had to do a video on this day of Dota because it was so awesome, but we're going to try and take a more bird's eye view here coming up, looking at the major storylines that came out of Kiev, as well as all of these teams and their road upcoming to, DI, to TI. Thanks very much for listening, and I'll talk to you again soon.